our scripture this morning. Our scripture this morning is found in Psalms 139, 14. And it's found on page 598 in your pew Bible. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Thank you for the, for the scripture. I know it's a bit of a hazard zone up here with all the wires and everything. Who <laughs> was here for the last week on the creation of the universe? This week is the creation of life, and I don't know if you know, but there's kind of a, a logical progression here. If you thought the universe was pretty spectacular, at least what little we talked about last week, life, even the simplest living thing, is more complex than the entire universe. The odds of the balanced nature, the delicately balanced nature of the universe we talked about last week is 1 in 10 to the 500, right? One part in 10 to the 500. That's the, uh, the odds of balancing the universe just right, like it is. The odds for one of the machines, the, the uh, bacterial flagellum, for example, when within a single living thing, a single cell organism, the odds for that is one part in 10 to the 10,000. So it's just enormously more complex. And so we're kind of going in a progression, and then next week it'll be even worse, <laughs> or better, however your perspective is, as far as God, the creator of time, is concerned. So this week, though, is God, the creator of life, and we're just going to briefly touch on a few things. This is a very difficult talk for me to put together because there's so much to pick from. What am I going to say in, you know, 40 minutes or half an hour, you know? Uh, to compress it all into that small amount of time is quite a challenge, but we'll try to do our best, so bear with me. We might go a little fast, so, uh, but it's going to be on video. You can get it off of YouTube later this week if you miss something. So, life, it's an even greater creation than the universe, and there's certain things, especially uh, if you're a brand new father, for example, or a brand new mother, you see your new, newborn child and you're just like, that cannot just happen by itself or even a little baby fawn that's just tiny, it fits in your hand, that can just not happen by itself. And we'll kind of find out why. The Bible, of course, makes certain claims about how it all happened. It said, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So that's the claim. Of course, you notice that Sigurd made me strategically cut off uh, certain of these pictures. <clears throat> Same with David, you know, <laughs> strategic. David said, King David, I praise you, this is our text, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your mar works are marvelous. I know that full well. Did David really know it full well? All right? Did they, I mean, David's a prophet and everything, but what did he really know about how complex we really are? He thought he might have had it all figured out, but... Man, we know a lot more now about how much fuller and uh, incredibly uh, spectacularly we are, we are made. Um, here, for example, Drew in the children's story talked about the development of a child. And it's very spectacular. It's a, like a giant origami project. We'll get into it in a little bit more detail as we go along. But how a child is formed, it starts out like a flat sheet of paper, sort of, and it gets folded and folded and folded and folded and folded, 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 folded. And all of a sudden, out comes a baby. It's just amazing if you study embryology. And of course, I had to do a little bit of promotion here <laughs> myself. So a little taste of life's complexity. Again, it's like, a, it's like God's origami project. It's incredibly complex, but it has a lot to do with folding and dividing things. Uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. Again, more complex than the universe. It's based on information. Again, information is key. It's not so much the fundamental parts. It's how those parts are arranged with each other in order to produce the complexity of life. And all the information is stored in a relatively simple molecule. It's called DNA, and it's based on a four-letter alphabet. Right, we're, we, in English, have 26 letters in our alphabet. Why do we need so many letters? 
God did it all with four, right? Of course, computers are based on two, right? Zeros and ones. But God did, used four letters to store all the information that codes for every one of us. And it's, uh, first of all, it's uh, transcribed into a functional code called RNA. And then that RNA is translated into a completely different alphabet that uses 20 letters. And those are called proteins. Anybody hear proteins? Right? Proteins are based on 20 letters, a 20 letter alphabet. And so how does all this happen? You have to understand the code. It's, if you don't understand the code, you're just going to get like random typing on a typewriter, right? You have to understand the code. And how is the body able to understand this code? You know, like it's kind of the chicken or the egg. Which came first, the code or the DNA, right? So it turns out that the more you look at the information in DNA, in modern science, even within the last five years, again, notice the strategic <coughs> uh, picture there. Uh, the more you look at DNA and the information in it, the more complex it gets. It's, uh, even if you start looking at it on an atomic level, within the last five years, it's been discovered that you can essentially store, at least theoretically, you can store infinite amount of information in a single atom. I don't know if you realize that, but you can theoretically store infinite amount of information in a single atom. So it's like universes and universes within universes. It's amazing how complex this place is, and especially living things. <clears throat> For example, here's, here's a little quote as far as discusses the complexity of it. This, this picture is a fractal, right? You understand fractals get more complex the closer you look at them. And so it says, we fooled ourselves into thinking that the genome was going to be a transparent blueprint, but it's not says Mel Greaves, a cell biologist at the Institute of Cancer Research in Sutton. Instead, as sequencing and other new technologies spewed forth data, the complexity of biology has seemed to grow by orders of magnitude. Delving into it has been like zooming into a Mandelbrot set, which is a fractal. It's a fractal space that is determined by a simple equation, but that reveals ever more intricate patterns as wind peers closer and closer at its boundaries. It seems like we are climbing a mountain that gets, keeps getting higher and higher, says Jennifer Dunda, a biochemist at the University of California, Berkeley. The more we know, the more we realize there is to know. Now, we're just scratching the surface, and the more we learn about everything, especially living things, the more complex and more complex it keeps getting. It doesn't get simpler the more we know. Our understanding about the most basic things, such as how a cell turns on and off. I mean, that's pretty simple. How do you turn on your computer, right? It's very complex. It's incredibly naive, uh, what we previously thought about how, how simple it supposedly was, says Joshua Plotkin, a mathematical biologist at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. For, just as an example to, to get you to comprehend some of this complexity, a lot of these cellular machines actually look like machines. Here's a bacterial flag flagellum, and it looks like an outboard motor. It has a rotor, it has a stator, it has a U-joint, it has bushings. It has all these things that function exactly like an outboard motor. And um, I'll just give you a little example. Oh, I'm not, this isn't just a diagram that somebody made up. Here's an electron scanning micrograph. And that's how it really looks. It's got, it looks mechanical, it, uh, like any machine a human would build. So here's a little video clip to give you some details on this uh, machine in particular. In the 19th century when Darwin was alive, uh, scientists thought that the basis of life, the cell, was some simple glob of protoplasm, like a little piece of jello or something that was not hard to explain at all. But with the hard work of science in the 20th century, we've seen that the, the cell is far from simple. It's, it's got very complicated molecular machines and things that are very resistant to Darwinian explanation. Most people have no idea of how, how small and complex cells are. A typical cell from you or me, called a eukaryotic cell, is probably a tenth of the size of the head of a pin. And yet, in that single cell, there are about three billion units of DNA making out the chromosomes. And those three billion units make the molecular machines of the cell, literally machines that make the cell work. With computer animation, we can enter the cell. Here, the staggering complexity of its molecular machinery is clearly seen. 
It's like going into uh, an automobile factory. The factory has a large number of machines. The parts have to fit together in very specific ways to do their jobs. And if things go wrong, the cell is in big trouble. And just one cell is enormously complex. But humans, you and I, are made from trillions of cells. And those trillions of cells have to fit together in the right way and do their own job. Darwinism was a lot more plausible when we were thinking about globs of protoplasm than it is when we're thinking about molecular machines. Each of these biochemical machines is a masterpiece of engineering and nanotechnology. They are essential to functions as vital and diverse as vision, photosynthesis, and the production of energy in the cell. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts and all of its glory. It's had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor. And I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That's designed, you know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Bee's reaction was not surprising especially when the bacterial flagellar motor is animated and magnified more than 50,000 times to display the details of its construction and operation. And Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. It's got some tail proteins which act as the propeller. When the flagellum rotates, these push against the water and therefore push the bacterium forward. And the motor uses a flow of acid from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell to power the turning. The bacterial flagellum has two gears, forward and reverse, water-cooled, proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller. It's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. In all, about 40 different protein parts are required to build a flagellar motor. Half of them are constructor proteins, specialized mechanisms that assemble the flagellum's individual components. Since its discovery, Biologists have tried to understand how a machine of such superb design could have arisen gradually, without foresight or plan, through the biological pathway Darwin envisioned. I think what Darwin was trying to show was that things that look designed aren't really designed, but that we can find naturalistic processes to account for the complexity of life. Darwin theorized that every part of every living organism evolved through natural selection, a blind process that acts upon random changes in the cell. Darwin believed that given enough time, these random variations would transform the simplest cells into the great diversity of life that inhabits our planet. Without the tools to observe the machinery of the cell, and long before the idea of irreducible complexity, Charles Darwin offered a way to test his own theory. In Origin of Species, he wrote, If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous, successive, slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Darwin acknowledged that if someone identified a biological system that could not have been constructed in incremental steps over long periods of time, then his theory would be invalid. And what Michael Behe and others have discovered is the existence of biological machinery that cannot be explained away by Darwinian processes. Darwin's failed predictions have in fact falsified his own theory. So that's pretty incredible, but let's just uh, show a few more examples. This next video clip I'll kind of talk you through. It's a uh, it's several different examples of micromachines. This is a mitochondria within every cell in your body. The mitochondria is responsible for making the energy of the cell called ATP. It's an incredibly complicated machine in itself. It's got all these molecular pathways and proteins along its surfaces. 
that are all interacting with each other in very complex ways. This is the machine, that two-geared machine, that's what makes the ATP. It's a mechanical machine. It's very complicated how it works. I didn't have time to go into detail on it, but it's extremely interesting if you want to look at it on your own. The mitochondria crawl along microtubules like worms to go to different places within the cell to get to places where the energy is most needed. Then within the nucleus of your cell, this is what goes on all the time in your bodies, millions of times a day. You copy your DNA with this other little machine that has arms on it that copies two different strands at the same time, one forward and one backward. And it copies them at an extremely rapid rate. This is a single picture of one of your chromosomes. This is a single strand of DNA all wrapped up around histones. Uh, if you linked all your DNA up end to end within one of your cells, it would be six feet long. And it helps to all be packaged into a tiny little cell, no bigger than a tenth of the size of the head of a pen. This is the nucleus as it's about ready to divide. It has to copy itself. All, each chromosome has to make a copy of itself. And then it, the chromosomes get pulled apart. Well, first they line up along the center of the cell. Then they get pulled apart at these very specialized areas, those little dots that are called centromeres. And they're very complicated structures. Here's a blow up of a centromere. The centromere has to know exactly the proper time when the chromosomes are properly lined up and the tension is just right on the microtubules. And how they kind of figure this out, in part, is due to these little creatures almost. They're little machines with little legs on them. And the little legs sense the, the, the proper setup, and then they start to walk away down the microtubules at the proper time when it, everything's ready to go. There they go, walking off. Here's inside a blood vessel. These are the white cells and red cells going down. As the white cell goes along the blood vessel, it, it senses signals along the vessel wall on these floating protein islands that tell it what to do along the endothelial wall. Those protein islands are floating around there. Now we're flying into the center of the cell, into the cytoplasm of the cell. Within the cytoplasm of the cell, there's all these structural proteins, these membranous uh, proteins or fibrillary proteins. And as they get to the proper length, there's these trimming proteins that come along and tell it where to trim it off at just the proper spot. And then there's these microtubules that help the cell move, like amoeba, amoeba movements, and also to help with transport of those little micro creatures that walk along. They walk along the surface of these things, and they pull along vesicles filled with proteins that need to go one from one place of the cell to another place in the cell for modification or for export. That little round structure at the end there, that's a centromere that helps in cell division. It has its own DNA. It's very complicated. Here's the nuclear pore. Out of these nuclear pores, it spits out those messenger RNAs. And then the messenger RNAs, they link together, and then they get decoded by these other proteins that know the code. And then they make proteins, which is that other language system I told you about. And the proteins get inserted into this other tube-like structure called the endoplasmic reticulum and then they bud off and make these little buds and then those buds are vesicles that get transported along by these walking feet that take it to the Golgi apparatus. In the Golgi apparatus, they modify the proteins for export or for other uses within the cell. And then the proteins are exported by exocytosis, which is another complicated process. And then the proteins are expressed along the surface of the endothelial cells in your blood vessels and it tells that macrophage, hey, there's an infection here, I need you to come help fight this infection. So the macrophage slips through the wall, the endothelial wall, and goes off into the tissues to help fight the infection. Here's the male gamete. It's a very complicated structure. It's very mechanical. And it has, it's, it has all, all these layers that help it do its job. Once the fertilization occurs, it starts cell division and it forms an early embryo, and then the embryonic plate, those blue cells in the middle, they form this flat structure like a sheet of paper, and then they start to fold. There's this groove, first of all, that goes right down the center of the paper, and it tells it where exactly is center to fold over upon. Here goes the groove down the middle, and then everything is based on that groove so that you're symmetrical, properly symmetrical, and then the thing starts to fold. 
and it folds and it folds and it folds and it develops all these structures, arms and legs, the heart, the eyes, then the face develops, the lungs, and it's just amazing. <laughs> God's giant origami project. So where does this, all this information come from? Again, is it natural? Does it just come as random chance? Or is it design? And it's kind of a philosophical concept, or is there some science behind it? And I think it, there's science, and I call it turtles all the way up. Uh, because I think, well, there's this story, the turtle story. This uh, scientist was giving a lecture on the origin of the universe and, and planet Earth, and and how it was all it came about. And this lady who's American Indian was in the back of, of the room and she stood up and she says, that's not true at all. She says, the world was built on the back of a turtle. And so the scientist thought he would be clever and he said, okay, what's the turtle standing on? And she says, oh, that's easy. It's turtled all the way down, all right? And so he used it, in, Stephen Hawking used it in his book as an illustration. I was like, well, then you get all the way to the last turtle, and what's that turtle standing on, right? Well, it's turtled all the way down. Well, eventually you get to the a turtle where you, you just can't get any farther to any other turtles, like the Big Bang. Well, what came, came before that? No one knows, right? Well, I also think it, it's turtles all the way up, because I think the first turtle was designed, and then you would go down from there. Uh, and the reason why I say this is because of the origin of information. How do you explain where information comes from? How to order all these structures? How can something build itself uh, as far as this informational complexity is concerned? And as an illustration, I like to use uh, Scrabble, Scrabble board. How many would believe that I took a bunch of Scrabble letters, this is actually my board, and I, I threw these letters out there and they just landed like that? How many would believe that? It's pretty reasonable, right? How about now? I just threw them out there and they landed like that. What if I did it like a few thousand times? One other, maybe occasionally it might sort of land like this. Maybe rarely. I mean, it, he wouldn't be completely insane. He might be sort of mental, but not, maybe not completely insane to believe that. But what about this? Now you're completely insane. Right? I, you know, I, I can sell you the London Bridge. I, you know, Big Ben, you want to buy that? I have it for sale, cheap. Right? So it's all based on this concept of sequence space. There's a certain, uh, there's a concept where everything that makes sense is encoded in a space, like three letters. There's a certain limited number of three letter, different three letter combinations. And it's the, your alphabet size to the power of three, right? So there's a certain, all, everything to the power of, like say you want 10 letter sequences, well that's 26 to the power of 10. That's the maximum number of different arrangements you can have. And so within that space, how many are meaningful? Well, two letter sequence space, the odds of something meaningful within the Scrabble dictionary, for example, is one in seven. And uh, three letter sequence space, it's one in 18, the, the ratio of meaningful versus non-meaningful. And for seven letter sequence space, it's one in 250,000. That includes combinations, not just of single words, but also combinations of smaller words, like three letter words and four letter words put together. So it's one in 250,000. Notice a pattern? It's an exponential pattern. The ratio declines exponentially, right? So the odds of, let's say you're on a seven letter sequence, first is a two letter sequence. What's the odds that I'm in a, going from cat to hat to bad to big to dig to dog? That's a three letter sequence space. Not bad, right? One in 18 tries, I'll get to another meaningful sequence. What are the odds in my seven letter sequence space randomly stepping off into the sequence space and landing by random chance on another meaningful seven letter sequence? It takes a lot longer, exponentially longer, more tries. And so that involves more time, exponentially more time. It's like stepping stones. If you want to evolve something close to the bank where there's more stepping stones, it's relatively easy. You can easily, like antibiotic resistance, for example. Not very complicated. Most of it is based on destruction of what's already there. Everybody hear the story of Humpty Dumpty said, I don't know, you know, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, all the king's horses. They couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Why? Because it's very easy to break something that's complicated. I can take my cell phone and stomp on it. Very easy and it doesn't work, right? Because there's so many different ways to break something. How easy is it for me to put my cell phone back together again? Right? Not very easy, right? 
because there's only one way, or very few ways, relatively speaking, to put it back together again. Same things happen with all language systems. The more complex you get, the much harder it is to put it back together again. But very easy to break it. Here's a little video clip to illustrate this concept. They're saying the odds are uh, very small. They're actually a lot smaller than that. <laughs> you see the last little tile fall into place? <laughs> All right. How many people would believe that's going to happen? Any kind of odds ever in the universe? Never, right? So houses just don't get built by a tornado, right? So <laughs> why not? Because it's informationally complex. The house takes a lot of information to put it together, and you're not going to get that without pre-existing information. You have to, could a robot build a house if it had enough information? Yes, it could, but where did the robot get the information? Either from another robot or from some other pre-existing intelligent designer. So again, where did the first intelligent designer come from? It's internals all the way up, right? It had to have always been there. That's why, do we believe God is eternal? He has to have been. Otherwise, either you believe God is eternal and that information has always been there, a massive amount of information in God's brain, or you believe that information came from nothing, that it just came out of nothing. So which would you rather believe? Is it easy to understand God? No. Is it easy to understand how something came from nothing? No. But where does the evidence point? Which uh, difficult concept does evidence point toward? Toward God who we can't understand or toward uh, big bang out of nothing that we can't understand. So, but we can't understand which way the information is going, up or down. We can at least understand that much, I think. Another interesting uh, concept about nature, living things in particular, is that it's based on beauty. God, uh, how many people think mathematics is beautiful? <laughs> in school, I did not think so. <laughs> but it really is. Nature is based on math. Uh, everything in nature, the universe, living thing, it's all based on mathematics. It's a language of math. Uh, and God uses numbers and mathematics to build everything with. And there's, for example, one example here is the Fibonacci series. The Fibonacci series is a very simple formula. It's based on adding the previous two numbers together to make the next number. For example, 1 plus 2 equals 3, right? 3 plus 2 equals 5, 5 plus 3 equals 8, and so on, right? That's all called the Fibonacci series, and it's used for all kinds of things in architecture. The Greeks used this sequence, Parthenon, and all kinds of Greek structures, including the statues, all the Greek statues you see. All of them is based on the Fibonacci series. And it's, anybody here the golden rectangle? Golden rectangle is based on the Fibonacci series because if you graph out the Fibonacci series on a plot graph, it draws that spiral shape. And the spiral shape fits within a rectangle, which if you chop the rectangle into a third and then put the third onto the other side of the, what's left of the rectangle, you keep making more and more rectangles as you go around. So it's called the golden rectangle. And this golden rectangle is thought to be, have a beautiful symmetry to it. Here's the Parthenon. And you can see it fits within the golden rectangle. Eggs, golden rectangle. All kinds of things in nature are based on this Fibonacci series. Plants, the, the way leaves are arranged, the way uh, even microscopic organisms, worms, this is a worm cross-section of a worm. Uh, flowers, the, the way the uh, center of flowers are arranged is all, pine cones, they're all based on this same Fibonacci pattern. Uh, even the galaxies have uh, the pattern to them. Uh, certain types of shells, um, Sunflowers, uh, baby's breath, honeycombs have it. All kinds. Uh, here's a, a fractal. Anybody think this was computer generated? This is computer generated fractal. How about this? You think this is computer generated? Yeah. You know what this is? Anybody know what this is besides Luciano? Well, huh? Storm. No? Shower. It's uh, Romanesco broccoli. 
Isn't that cool? Again, this is a Fibonacci pattern. It's also a fractal at the same time. The closer you look at it, the more complex and repeatable it is. Um, anybody know this Leonardo da Vinci uh, drawing? Humans are based on Fibonacci. They're also ba we also have multiple types of symmetry to us. Triangles, circles, uh, squares, Fibonacci. Notice the golden rectangle off to the side. A and B, two thirds, one third sort of deal. It's all based on the same mathematical principle of what's considered beautiful. Now this is interesting. What are SETI scientists looking for when they look in outer space and looking for little green men? Right? They're looking for extraterrestrials to so send us radio signals. This guy, he is Seth Shostak. He's the senior astronomer at the SETI Institute. And this is what he says that they're looking for. How they know it will be intelligent. Right? He says, perhaps the extraterrestrials will preface their message, their radio signal message, with a string of prime numbers or maybe the first 50 terms of the ever popular Fibonacci series, which we just saw. Well, there's no doubt that such mathematical tags would convey intelligence. No doubt, according to this guy who's looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. So, uh, haven't we found it? I mean, Fibonacci series is everywhere in nature, in signals in living things and non-living things. Why then doesn't all of a sudden dawn on people, hey, what are we, what are we looking at here, right? Also, these guys, Thaxton, um, Walter Bradley, Ro uh, Robert Olson, they write, why then doesn't the message sequence on the DNA molecule also constitute prima facie evidence for an intelligence source? After all, DNA information is not just analogous to a message sequence such as the Morse code. It is such a message sequence, right? There's real information there. Arguably, there's more uh, complex information in a, in a comparable sequence of DNA than there is in any, any sequence of Fibonacci. I mean, uh, or the string of pi numbers or anything like that because uh, DNA is not like a based on a simple repeatable pattern. DNA is not repeatable. It's based on a different type of information, uh, language, language complexity, which is not predictable. A late mathematician and physicist, Nobel laureate uh, Wigner, Eugene Wigner, he, he wrote an unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences, sciences uh, that we often take for granted. He says, the enormous usefulness of mathematics is something bordering on the mysterious. There is no rational explanation for it. The miracle of the appropriateness of language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. So where did this information come from? Where did mathematics come from? Here's uh, kind of on a bigger scale. A woodpecker is, is amazing. Do you know uh, the woodpecker pecks about 22 times a second? And the force of gravity that's placed on that little bird's brain is 1,200 Gs. You know, 1,200 times the force of gravity. It has to, in order to achieve this, every single time it pulls back its head to give another peck in that 22 times a second, Every single time it pulls back its head, it has to open its eyes, readjust its beak, and then go back in again and close its eyes so that if it hits just off center just a little bit, it will blow apart its head. And even if it does hit just right, it has to close its eyes so they don't fly out. Right? And so that little wood, wood chips don't fly in and hit his eyes and hurt them. So he has to open, close, open, close 22 times a second right? and readjust all in that split second of time, so it just hits in the right spot. Also notice the tongue of the woodpecker. It doesn't go straight out of its mouth. It wraps around its brain, around the backside, comes down, and then out. In order to get the distance, it needs to reach that little bug deep inside of there. Now just think about the first, first woodpecker. Woodpecker, oh, I didn't like that little bug. I hear him scratching around there, and I would like to go get him. Peck, peck, peck. Brain gone everywhere, right? And if you don't, you know, well, I'll peck slowly, right? Peck slowly, and maybe I'll evolve better as I go along, right? Well, if you peck slowly, the little bug inside is going to hear something pecking, right? And it's going to crawl away. Right? You cannot do this slowly. It's either now or never, right? So uh, there's a lot of other features about the woodpecker's brain that I can't go into, but it's amazing. Um, giraffe. You know, giraffe has a big, long neck, right? In order to get the blood up to his head, way up there in the sky, it's got to have a huge heart, like this big. 
it's got major blood pressure problems, right? Get, just to get that blood up to his head. Because you've got to supply the brain. The brain uses more energy than any other tissue in your body. So you've got to supply the blood to the brain. So the heart goes along, and now all of a sudden the giraffe decides it wants a drink. So he puts his head down, and all that blood pressure goes the wham into the brain, right? Blows a part of poor giraffe's brain. The giraffe is dead, right? But no, we have special little valves that release the blood pressure and let it go around the brain and bypass the brain when he lifts his head down to get a drink. Otherwise, the giraffe would die. It also has a spongy thing that absorbs blood pressure when he puts his head down. In that brief second before the little valves can open, there's a spongy thing that goes and fills up so it absorbs the blood pressure and it'll blow it apart in the brain. Right? So how do you evolve that slowly? You know, the giraffe's, the giraffe's necks get a little longer, and his heart gets pumping a little bigger. Well, now he has to lower his head, and bam! You know, well, maybe I should evolve valves that bypass my brain. Well, how does he decide to do that? It takes a long time to bypass the brain before you can actually divert blood pressure like that. You can't, it just doesn't make sense to me how that could possibly happen in a gradual way. So, why, do, why didn't you, most scientists reject creation or design in nature? When it seems like everything that you would otherwise think is designed is rejected out of hand as, as a result of a mindless random chance process. So here are these two guys. Again, I talked about them briefly, at least one of them last week. Frederick Hoyle is the guy who came up with, with the term Big Bang Theory. He didn't believe in it, but uh, he still was a naturalist who believed it, was, it all came apart came across naturally until he started looking at the fine-tuned features of the universe and then of life itself. And he decided, well, at least there had to be some designer somewhere sometime to explain it all. And he, with his friend, uh, Chandra Rikram Singh, he's a mathematician, also very well known, uh, they decided, well, it must have come from outer space. Then later along, they wrote a book called uh, 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 the, God was the creator. They attribute it to God himself. They use the, the term God. So in this particular book, they wrote, from the beginning of this book, we have emphasized the enormous informational content of even the simplest living systems. The information cannot, in our view, be generated but what are often called natural processes, as, for instance, through meteorological or chemical processes. Information was also needed. We have argued that this requisite information came from an intelligence even if it was from outer space, like an alien did it, right? Just don't call him God, please, but some kind of intelligence. I mean, uh, Chandrika Ramsing in particular went on to explain his mindset and what, what happened to him when he came to this conclusion. He said, it was quite a shock. From my earliest training as a scientist, I was very strongly brainwashed to believe that science cannot be consistent with any kind of deliberate creation. That notion has had to be very painfully shed. I am quite uncomfortable in this situation, the state of mind I now find myself in. But there is no logical way out of it. So he doesn't want to believe in a god. He's naturally predisposed to naturalism, right? But now he's forced by looking at nature to say, hey, man, this stuff is beyond any sort of uh, naturalistic mechanism that I can possibly think of. It, there must be some kind of intelligence out there. So he says, now I find myself driven, driven to this position by logic. There's no other way in which we can understand the precise ordering of the chemicals of life except to invoke creations on a cosmic scale. We were hoping as scientists that there would be a way around our conclusion, but there isn't. And he writes this in, there must be a God. All right? So he's made the next logical step. Okay, now there's an alien intelligence. Take another step. Now there's a god, right? Because it's so far beyond, I mean, the level of intelligence you're talking about, if you found an alien that intelligent, you wouldn't know if he was a god or not. He would say, I'm a god, and you're like, okay. Right? It's just, a, you have to be amazingly intelligent to explain the simplest living thing and the universe as well. John Sanford, Cornell University a professor of genetics, inventor of the gene gun. He's a former atheist, then he took another step studying nature, then he became a theistic evolutionist, and then a full-blown creationist. And he wrote a book in 2005 called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. I thought some passages in this book were pretty interesting as far as the mindset of what it takes to be a naturalist. Since late in my career, I did something for which a Cornell professor would seem unthinkable. I began to question the primary axiom. In other words, the mechanism of evolution, random mutation, and natural selection. I did this with great fear and trepidation. 
By doing this, I knew I would be at odds with the most sacred cow of modern academia. Among other things, it might even result in my expulsion from the academic world. So there's some personal sacrifice going on here. If you step out of scientific mainstream, you might get ostracized and lose your career. That's pretty good motivation, right? To my own amazement, I gradually realized that the seemingly great and unassailable fortress, which has been built up around the primary axiom, is really a house of cards. The primary axiom is actually an extremely vulnerable theory. In fact, it is essentially indefensible. It apparent, its apparent invincibility derives mostly from bluster, smoke, and mirrors. A large part of what keeps the axiom standing is an almost mystical faith which true believers have in the omnipotence of natural selection. Right? In other words, is belief in natural selection, at least according to this guy, is it based on science or philosophy? Philosophy. This is not about science anymore. This is about a religious style faith. Furthermore, I begin to see that the deep-seated faith in natural selection was typically coupled with a degree of ideological commitment which can only be described as religious. I started to realize again with trepidation that I might be offending a lot of people's religion. Right? So, you know, the concept of separation of church and state. Naturalism or Darwinism is a state-sanctioned state religion. It really is. There's really no other way to describe it. If you really look at... Uh, Dis, well, the complexity of nature with an unjaundiced, candid mind, uh, you have to come to at least the conclusion, the very least the conclusion, that there's an intelligence behind it. If the primary axiom is wrong, then there is a surprising and very practical consequence. When, the, when subjected only to natural forces, the human genome must irrevocably degenerate, not evolve, it must decay over time. In other words, we're getting worse and worse over time. Such a sober realization should have more than just intellectual or historical significance. It should rightfully cause us to personally reconsider where we should be rationally placing our hope in the future. Now, obviously, we all get older over time. We start out young and good looking, at least some of us, right? <laughs> and then we uh, get older. By the time we're 60 years old, we have 60,000 mutations that we didn't have when we were born. 60,000 mutations. So as we get older, the reason why we start degenerating and our tissues start breaking down is because the informational complexity of our system starts being lost, right? We get to be randomly scrambled, and then eventually we can't tolerate it anymore, and we die, right? Same thing ha happens to the genome as a whole. In every generation, every new child, has between 200 and 300 mutations, new mutations at birth, that the parents did not have, right? And most of those mutations are now known to be functional, and most of those functional mutations, a thousand to one, are known to be detrimental. So the human genome is degenerating along with every other slowly reproducing species on Earth, like all mammals, for example. So we're not evolving, we are known for a fact to be devolving. We're degenerating, we're headed toward extinction. Eventual extinction over time. So, here's a little clip along these lines. Hello, I'm creation. And I am the theory of evolution. Why, why are you so happy? Oh, are you kidding? Because I have hope. Hope? Mm-hmm. You know, in the assurance that I have a purpose. A purpose? Mm-hmm. You can have one too, you know. I don't want one. <laughs> what are you talking about? Everybody wants to have a purpose. That's not true. Some people want to hold to the unproven fact that we're nothing more than a bunch of protoplasmic goo that evolved over billions of years and will end up as cosmic garbage, therefore serving no one or no purpose at all. No hope or purpose? Right. That's so sad. So, if you have the option, and there's actually evidence for God, not just a God that set it all in motion, but actually a God that cares about you personally, why would you want to discard that for the privilege of saying you came from slime mold? Right? You want a pope and a purpose or don't you? So, here's kind of a concept to illustrate my point is uh, the butterfly. You know, the butterfly is a caterpillar, right? And the caterpillar goes along and gets fat and chubby and then it decides to make a chrysalis around itself. And then, as it makes a chrysalis around itself, within the caterpillar, 
there are these cells called imaginal cells. They're not imaginary, they're, that's just, they're called imaginal. And these cells start to proliferate and they, they uh, take over the caterpillar's body and they liquefy the caterpillar. The caterpillar does not like the liquefaction process and it mounts an immune response to try to kill off these imaginal cells because they treat them as foreign invaders, which they really are because who wants to be liquefied, right? But the immune system loses the battle, imaginal cells win, and they use the liquefied juices of the caterpillar to build another creature called a butterfly. There is nothing about a butterfly that's like a caterpillar. All the parts are different, completely reordered, completely rearranged, built out of the goo of the caterpillar. Right? They turn the caterpillar to sludge, use sludge to build another creature. So it's really like two creatures in one. Two creatures in one creature. How did that happen? How did two creatures get into being in one creature slowly by random chance? So it's kind of like us. We're kind of like two creatures in one. We start out as a little worm. And really, the Bible describes us as worms. Uh, if you don't believe me, uh, read, read what God uh, talked to Jacob about. It. He says, don't be afraid, O worm Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Yeah. Right? So does God look at us as worms? Yeah. But fortunately, uh, in Isaiah 40, that's Isaiah 41, 14, Fortunately, God likes worms, and he wants to do something with us, right? He doesn't want to leave us as worms. He wants to turn us into butterflies or something more spectacular than we can ever imagine. Um, so the greatest miracle, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone, is in, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old one has gone, the new has come, and you're brand new, right? Who wants to stay as you are? Do you want to be reborn and born into something better than you were before? God wants to help you. Can you make yourself be reborn? No. Who is able to create the new heart? Right? So here's David. David was a worm if there ever was a worm. Right? David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Who needs to say that? Right? We need, and so... Can we create our own clean heart? We need help. Somebody who is able to have fantastic creative power. This is more complicated. This is more difficult for God than creating all of life on earth, all of the universe, everything else. This is more difficult because what did it cost God to be able to do this? It cost God everything. God had to die to be able to achieve this uh, feat. It's a fantastic miracle. So God says, okay, I will do it. I will sacrifice everything to do this for you. He says, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And Ellen White says in Evangelism, page 290, the conversion of the human soul is of no little consequence. It is the greatest miracle performed by divine power. So trust the creative power of God to work ultimately in your best interests, even when the going seems to be very tough indeed to the point of losing your life. Like Job said, though he slay me as the worm, as the caterpillar, right? The caterpillar dies. It doesn't exist anymore. And it's not necessarily a completely comfortable process. And, but we need to understand that God still has our ultimate interest in mind as we're going through the struggles of this life. And he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So well, again, what kind of future does a worm have? Anyway, right? Do we want to stay as we are? Or do we want to be something better?